back. Uh, we were listening to uh, 9-11, some clips earlier, if you just joined us, from Ed Schultz and Tank McNamara's uh, and Don Haney's coverage that day. I shouldn't just say Don Haney, Paul Jurgens, and the whole great uh, news team here at the home base of the News and Views Radio Network at KFGO. But Ed Schultz walked up to an individual as they were being evacuated from the Hart Building. Now, uh, take a listen to what we played uh, just a little bit earlier. Sir, we're on the Clear Channel Radio Network. What's your name? Scott Corley. Scott, what do you do? I work for Senator Allen of Virginia. Okay. Tell us what's the latest. You know, I'm, I'm with Clear Channel out of North Dakota. We just left Senator Conrad's office. We were told to evacuate the Senate Hart Building. What do you know at this point? What, what's uh, your senator's office hearing? All we're hearing is that there's a possibility this is a terrorist uh, act on the part of a coordinated organization that's been unnamed so far. Um, basically, uh, what the news is reporting is all anyone really knows. It's, uh, it's kind of chaos, and we're all kind of wondering why we had no idea this was going to take place in advance, as organized and as planned as it seems to be. Okay. What is your senator going to do, Senator Allen from Virginia? Uh, what, what, what's the next move? Well, uh, I think that this kind of puts an exclamation point on the need to pass a strong defense budget, and we're going to support that. Uh, but more importantly, we need to investigate why this happened. And uh, at the same time, we need to be there for the families of the people who, uh, who had loved ones that lost their lives in all of this. If you could describe uh, the mood here in Washington, uh, it, 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 it's really unbelievable. It is. You have a sense that uh, your heart just fell out of your chest. Um, it's just unbelievable that this could happen to us, and I think we had a feeling of invulnerability, and this shows how vulnerable we are. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. So there you have it, uh, one of the workers out of uh, Senator Allen's office, uh, Senator Allen uh, just elected in the state of Virginia. Scott Corley, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Amy said, let's find him. She did. Uh, Scott, good to have you on the News and Views Radio Network. Thank you. I appreciate it. That had to bring back some memories. Uh, my, everybody here was talking, Scott, about how we don't forget where we were at that time. Do you remember at all Ed Schultz coming and interviewing you? Oh, I do. Uh, Ed popped out of a building. Um, it was like a, it, it was like a peekaboo moment. You know, I, I just was walking down the street with um, one of my colleagues and like, hey, come over here, man. <laughs> so it was, that I was mean, in the middle of being shocked, it was a shocking thing as well. But, I mean, he was he was clearly also shaken. I mean, we were both were. We were standing there looking at each other, which you can't convey over the radio. And we're just kind of, I, I mean, I remember feeling like I didn't have a lot of blood in my body. And he looked similarly, I'm sure. Uh, he didn't realize it either. And so it's. It was. Um, I remember it very well. Absolutely. So, Scott, uh, in in terms of your age at that time, how old were you? I was twenty six. Like that, and I made reference to that earlier. How you, you know, you had these bright, intelligent staffers in their twenties as they're just getting started in their career. But you look back, Scott, on what you told Ed as far as information goes. Short of saying Al Qaeda, you, you nailed it. I mean, you you you, na you nailed it. Well, can I can I follow up on that? What did you know more at that time? And you didn't tell him. I no, I I didn't. Um, I was riding, I was driving into work actually when I heard about the second tower. The news that was on. Um, they were saying a plane had flown in, and I just seen a documentary about some biplane in the fifties that you know accidentally ran into the Empire State Building doing tourist things. We didn't have a lot of info, so I thought, well, you know, some moron, um, you know, was trying to do something neat above New York City. And, and granted, this is pre-9-11, obviously, it's 9-11 we're talking about. And so it didn't occur to me that, you know, that people would have this attitude of this is a restricted space. We need to be very careful that the world was slightly different in terms of what you could believe someone might do. Now you think, you know, they're going to get shot down by a missile before they even get close to that, that sort of point. But the... The mood was, you know, okay, this is just an accident, and then the second plane hit. Then I, I heard the Pentagon get hit. Um, I went upstairs. My boss had come through the office, put his head on, on my, on his hand on my head, and said, you need to get out of here right now. And that's the first time I felt like that real blood-draining, kind of chilled feeling, and they knew this other plane was flying around in there. Uh, so we had gone upstairs to try and get some of our stuff to work. We thought we'd still be working. And I saw Ted Kennedy running down the hallway. I mean, I'll never forget that. On the third floor, 
of the uh, Russell building where his office was, running down the hallway with his little dog trotting next to him. And Ted was old and, and kind of a big man at that point, but he was running. And that, that, that's when it really struck me. There's something terrible. So everything was extrapolated from basically all of those all of those events, the series of things that occurred. So, Scott, in terms of uh, other staff, because I know how close staff can get, were you able to find your other coworkers, or was there their panic in any way there? Well, when I when I was with uh, when I saw Ed, um, I was with one of my friends. We had called another friend of ours uh, who actually worked for Ted Kennedy. Um, you know, back then I'm I'm on the Republican side. There, on the, this is pre super partisanship of today, right? People had these weird notions that you go to work, you do your job, and then you treat people like people. And so uh, Kevin is his name. Um, he was a tech staffer for for Kennedy. We went to the Union Station. They closed that completely down because it's a port of exit and entry. So we ended up going back to Hockenda, which your producer, Amy, will know, um, perhaps you too. It's just an old haunt in D.C. Off, off of Pennsylvania Avenue. So we went over there, and we watched everything play out. Uh, me and the Kennedy staffer and another staffer from my office with George Allen. We were there probably till four. We couldn't reach anybody. Probably remember that the cell phone network became overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was just basically a denial of service thing that was happening all day long. So you didn't know where anyone was, anyone you cared about. You couldn't reach anybody. And cell phones were not in their infancy, but only, you know, 10 years old, really, as a, as a main way of talking. So, we were there. I walked out of that Hawk and Dove, and it was apocalyptic. And, and it felt that way because everyone had abandoned their cars in the middle of the street. The town had cleared out, and they had set up a blockade so you couldn't come back in. So once you were out, you were out, and the town had cleared. So I walked from Hawk and Dove across the Capitol complex without seeing another human being, but seeing cars parked in the middle of the street everywhere abandoned. Mm -hmm. So it, it felt like a movie. It felt like I was in you know, an end of times type movie when we finally left there. I know Ed was with Senator Conrad at the time when the first tower went down, but, and, and we did a show that night, we were allowed back in the Hart building and we did a special show from Senator Conrad's office. But do you remember where the legislators went? Did they go to a shelter? I don't, I wish I did. I think some of them um, were sheltered in the Capitol. I'm not sure about that. I know some staff were there. Uh, I'm not sure that they pulled the full protocol of sending them off to, you know, the actual real con con congressional bunker. Um, I, I just I don't know. I wasn't privy. Scott, I know there was a lot of talk about that plane that went down in Pennsylvania. Um, what was their talk among staff, amongst the senators that uh, that you you served and worked for at that time? about where that plane might head and, and what reaction you might have to it, not knowing that there could be more? I think there was. Um, definitely they sensed, and they could tell by what was happening with the plane that hit the Pentagon, that they were trying to hit the White House. And uh, I don't know if they kind of fully put together that the Pentagon was the secondary target, um, but they felt like the plane, that was what we were told that there's a plane coming for the Capitol. And they, I think they thought that Pennsylvania plane, the unaccounted for plane, was the plane that was going to be aimed at the Capitol. So that was, that was all we knew. Scott, how did this change your life? What, what, I mean, you, you were in public service. You were getting paid next to nothing to help people. Yeah. I mean, really, you were, you were building a resume. And, and I, you know, I've had friends and family that have been congressional staffers. And, you know, I, I know the life that you were living. I, my guess is you were probably living with a couple other staffers just to make sure you could afford it. But what, what changed with you after that? I, you know, I think that the world felt a lot smaller. And, um, you know, the vulnerability, I mentioned it on, that was a, a, a real feeling that I, I was expressing. It wasn't just sort of hitting your you know, press triangle, which, again, if I hadn't been in shock, probably wouldn't have done as well hitting my press triangle, right? you got to make these points. Um, and I, I think the, the thing that really stuck out in my mind from that time is the sense of vulnerability. It's hard to convey. I have a 22-year-old daughter. She works for Mitch McConnell now. You know, it's it's that's how much time has passed. She was just born. And so it's um yeah, it, it, it is the sense that we at that point, 
knew, you know, someone might put something dirty. They tried for the World Trade Center before, little bombs here and there. The idea that they could create so much destruction and devastation, followed by what happened in, in the Middle East with the celebrations. I'm not commenting on, you know, the sort of attitude of the world and, and who brought what attitudes forward. I think we all agree that, that murder is murder. And it was, you know, an awful choice that was made to, to you know, demonstrate protest that way. But the thing that really happened is we didn't know for sure where it might come from. We overreacted in some ways. Uh, and, and, you know, people look back and they say, why, why are these laws the way they are? Well, you weren't there if you have to ask that question. Yeah. We were willing to do almost anything to protect ourselves. And that's, that's how it changed, because it also changed the environment for legislative conversation in a lot of ways. A lot of appeals were made to that day um, to get things done that sometimes were good and sometimes were an overreach for a democratic society. Yeah. Scott Corley is our guest. He, he was one of the staff members from Senator Allen's office that uh, was on the ground. Ed Schultz interviewed. You might have heard that a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, Scott, going back, uh, you know, you mentioned before hyperpartisanship. Um, I have to tell you, uh, you know, as a former Democratic state senator and brother of a United States Democratic uh, state senator, that I was so proud uh, to have George W. Bush as my president that day. Uh, the yeah. the reaction that he had and what he did uh, in New York on Times Square. I mean, Scott, you, you want to talk about a nation coming together. That was a proud moment for all of us. It was. I wish it didn't take tragedies, but it was. And, you know, it, it's a, I think what it does is it sort of grounds people again. They, they lose touch. They they disassociate, you know, their humanity when they get caught up in, in sort of not trivial, but but certainly oversized uh, thoughts and fights, and and some of that exists in their mind. Some of it's generated by, you know, groups that are trying to generate that kind of black and white ire in order to, you know, promote whatever they're doing or even just make money. So it's never been the case that we don't have those political influences. But you're right when we. When we came out of that on the other side within days, I, I think, you know, everyone sincerely wanted to try and do what was right. I think everyone enjoyed the relief of the excuse not to be so partisan. And I wish we didn't need tragic events and, and you know, huge moments, usually bad moments, to, to provide people a feeling that they can safely not, you know, put up this partisan, angry front all the time. And and when you see it, you're like, ah, yeah, yeah, that's you. That's actually you I'm talking to now, not someone who's looking for every moment for contrast in order to think about some next electable moment. So I, I agree with you. There was a time there, and there have been times since. But uh, it, it's just sad that it, it really does require an excuse, like the tragic loss of life, to, to get there. You mentioned about how the cell service was so crazy that afternoon, and I was trying to make calls on behalf of Ed in Washington, D.C., and I remember it'd be like a half hour's worth of busy signals. That's all I did was sit and hit redial. But what time did you finally hear from your office staff, and how did they get a hold of you guys to come back to the Capitol? And then what was that first staff meeting like when you guys all came back together? Well, we were out for a, a day, actually a little bit longer um, after it happened. We, we did everything by phone or just daisy chain. Um, we had email. Uh, sounds weird to say that but you do have to clarify it's 2001. We did have active email usage back, back then. Um, we got a hold of folks at 4. I think 4 o'clock is what I remember seeing. Um, we had, uh, you know, and I don't, I'm not ashamed to say it was a working day, but it wasn't that we had drank quite a few Guinnesses at this point. Uh, I think pretty much everyone had been crying because we watched those two towers fall, even now. I mean, if you watch those towers fall on a, on a replay, you flash back to when you saw it happen and the shock that you felt. And so that, you know, walking out of there, I wasn't really in a good state to, to do much of anything except yeah. go home and try to decompress. The next staff meetings, the, the conversations we were having were almost all about the legislative activities that were going to occur. And a lot of it was spending. I worked on something called cows, cells on wheels to, to deal with 
the issue of what happens in an emergency when your your cell phone network is going to get a lot more users than the providers had planned for at any one moment. And so you, you drive these things out. They help boost signals. They help repeat signals. So everyone was working on some element of that. There's you know people in our office that were working on sort of water. What if they attack our water system? So we learned a lot about D.C. water. We actually found out that one line of D.C. water was being polluted on a regular basis, yeah. causing illness. So, I mean, there's like weird I, things that, that occurred. I remember, you remember that. that. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Uh, I was in the water industry. That's why I remember that so well. Uh, last question, Scott. Uh, you know, your daughter, she is a staff member for one of the most powerful individuals in this country, period. Do you worry about her safety? I do. She flew back from Texas last night, and it's strange we're having this conversation. Her plane plane was delayed, and she was going to land, which she did this morning, very, very early, like 1245. And it just for a split second, I thought, what if someone is going to choose this date, sort of like a Timothy McVeigh moment, yeah. and, and she's flying in here, I just... You know, it didn't last long. It wasn't as formed as I'm even making it out right now. It did cross my mind. Um, and I thought about it today because uh, she works in the Capitol. She works in the leadership office. And, you know, I mean, as confident as I am that, you know, at least we can watch our skies a little bit better than we used to be able to. I mean, they, the people who want to do this are as aware of, you know, what we're capable of as, as we are. And so it's not, you know, you don't know we're going to catch you. They know exactly how we could catch them. We've just made it very hard. But I, I am confident that someone who wants to hurt us could find a way again. And uh, it always it always worries me for her and, and everyone I love who works up here. Scott, uh, you know, thank you. Thank you for your time. But you tell that daughter of yours, thanks for your service uh, as well. Uh, that's that's hard work she's doing. So I appreciate it. I will. I appreciate it. It's it's. Really fascinating and interesting to catch up with uh, you all after so much time. Yeah. 26 years old, 22 years ago. So you thanks bet. for uh, reaching out. Well, you didn't have to take the call and you did. So I owe you a Guinness. Okay, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, have Mike. A good day. You bet. Uh